Richard Wills. Here. And Patrick Brunston, I don't see. Okay. So I would make a motion to excuse Pat Brunstead, uh, and, and but still in the hopes that he may tune in before the meeting's over. Why don't we wait with that motion? Um, and I've texted him. I know he had some. I know he had things going on, but he was he was planning on being on this. Okay. I, I would draw the motion then. Okay. So do I have a motion to approve the meeting agenda? So moved. Second. Is Eleanor and Greg? And Richard, you're taking notes. Right? I am taking notes. Okay. Uh, and Greg Cox seconded. Okay. Any discussion? So move. I uh, motion to approve the minutes of May 25th, 2021. So moved. Move. Second. So who, who, who moved? Yes. Who? Richard. Oh, okay, Rich. And Greg Clark seconded. Oh, here's Pat. Okay. I make a motion to withdraw my motion to excuse Pat Brunstad. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Dan, what was, what was the date of the last meeting? The 25th, May 25th. May So there's no discussion. So moved in. <clears throat> we are to public comment. Sir, do we have any public comment? I did not receive any written public comment. However, we do have citizens on the line. Marlene Penry, do you have a public comment? Yes, I do. Okay, go ahead. Hi, um, I missed the last couple of meetings, so I'm not really sure exactly where in your chart on design on architectural standards you are. Um, so I might be premature, or I might be too late, whatever. Um, wish I was a little more organized. Um, just in, first in general, I wanted to comment on the idea of moving all the things that you've been talking about into a 1750 chapter in general, rather than inside of the other zoning codes. And I think that sounds like a really good idea for things like roofing and siding and screening and, and things like that. I think it might be a little problem when you get into the multi-family units and things like the front porches and the articulations and stuff like that. It might be a problem. I haven't thought it all the way through. But I do like the idea of pulling them all into a concise place in code. I would think, though, if you're going to do this, I would suggest it be elevated out of the middle of, of miscellaneous provisions, since I think architectural design is a lot more than miscellaneous. I think that it could be its own 1750 chapter section in itself. Um, so again, not knowing exactly where you are in here, I have a comment on number seven, where it says the architectural style of garage shop or shed must match the style of primary structure. I take a little exception to shed there because you can buy pre-manufactured sheds and a lot of different kinds of materials that aren't gonna look just like your house. Um, Item eight screening, I'm, I'm a little bit confused. Um, I'm, if I'm understanding right, the left column is what you're proposing to put in the code and that's something completely, appears to be something completely new. Um, I, do I do wonder about things like public utilities, really confused on what screening public utilities means since obviously things like electrical boxes, cable boxes, uh, anything, things like that that are placed on a side wall are still visible from the street. So I'm not sure what you meant by public utilities. I also wonder about the inclusion of propane tanks because they certainly aren't screened now. There's a lot of them visible from the street and I, you know, perhaps you're proposing a change to that. So if you're not proposing a change to that, that isn't the way it is now, I don't think. Okay, second column I'm a little confused about because you aren't proposing to move 832030 into 175210, are you? Uh, this is like I, a rhetorical question, not one I'm starting you to answer. Um, because this C item here is part of our nuisance code, and you certainly wouldn't want to move it out of the nuisance code. Then on 175120 fences, this is an interesting one because 
you might want to move it into the into the 1750 whatever um, 210 because aren't fences part of the architectural look of a house when you drive by like I didn't find any place that said front fences can't be higher than four feet um, and there's you know a lot of problems with the fencing code the way it is and there's some changes that could need, need to be changed to 1751-20 even if you don't elevate it um, for one thing it's it says no fence wall or vegetation when used for screening may exceed six feet in height I believe they meant the vegetation when used for screening but it makes it sound like anything that's not used for screening has no limits so it's worded very poorly and it makes you sound, makes it sound like anything can be much higher than that. Uh, people use, and plus people use fences for things other than screening, like keeping dogs in and keeping deer out. So I think the wording here, the more I thought about it, I think they meant screening vegetation, not the overall screening, but it needs, something needs to be fixed there. Um, and then screening, you can screen with trees and they should not have a, a height limit on them. So big problems with 1751-20A and then a question whether you want to move fences into architectural or design standards. Um, I think um, I think that's all I have for now. Thank you very much. Uh, the next citizen is Anne Reese. Anne, do you have a public comment? Uh, just a brief one, um, and that's primarily having to do with the new um, provision for wanting to screen the utilities and propane tanks and such. Uh, one, if, if we're going to grandfather in the however many thousand houses that we already have, um, then what's the point in making all new construction comply with, with this new requirement? Second, I don't, I, I agree with the, the last comment that, you know, a lot of these public utilities are further out toward the street. Um, and I don't know how reasonable it is to try and, and screen those. And regarding propane tanks, um, there's not a lot of room on the side of my house, for example, uh, for accessibility for, for filling that propane tank. And if I put up some kind of a hedge or uh, a fence or something, then I could be impeding access to that tank either for filling or in the, the event of an emergency so that the fire department could secure the propane at the tank if there were a problem at my house. So um, I, I tend to question adding this at all. Um, certainly we don't want to allow anybody to put a propane tank in front of their house, but if it's, you know, down the side of the house and, you know, not like in your face out in front, I don't know why we would be requiring screening all of this stuff now when it hasn't been a requirement in the past. That's all, thank you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, I'm gonna turn it over to Tanya in a minute um, to lead our discussion or Richard, I don't know which one is gonna do it today, but I wanted to make a comment about something that I've seen recently, and it just dawned on me that we haven't addressed this at all. Um, I have a house, two houses over, or three houses over. The guy's a contractor for Aberdeen, and he comes out and leaves construction equipment in his front yard. And uh, he's had a man lift there for since last August. And there's nothing in the code that says he can't do that. That's what Alicia told me. So why we're going I thought I saw something. Pardon? I'm sorry. I was reading today and I thought I saw something that forbid construction type equipment to be stored in the yard. If they what what Alicia told me, <laughs> if they bring it in and out quickly, it, there's nothing you can do. That's that's the part they can't do if they if they bring it for a little bit and then take it away. But she said if there was a like this man lift that's been there since August, there's nothing they can do. That didn't make sense to me. So we should research that, Greg. 
I'm, you know, as you guys have brought up and, and even our guests have brought up, we're dealing with issues that are way beyond building designs. That's what this all started with. And, you know, if, if that's what the Planning Commission wants to do is continue to rewrite the code uh, from front to back, I suppose we can keep doing this. And, but we've spent three months on this building design standards, not building standards per se. And um, it's, it's sort of frustrating to me that now we're talking about fences and screening and we've got lighting built into the, the changes that we're recommending and we've gone way beyond our charge. Um, and, you know, based on the summary that Richard put together under notes and observations, you know, after spending three months on this, we really have not come up with anything earth shattering. Um, for all practical purposes, we've managed to put, as some people might say, lipstick on a pig. We have not changed demonstrably um, the structural integrity issues associated with manufactured homes in this climate. So we're hardly talking about building standards. We're talking about some aesthetics and they were focused originally on manufactured homes and we decided we would make it all encompassing, which I understand. But now we've gotten into, you know, whether or not people can park cars in their driveway or vehicles or machinery. And um, it just strikes me that we're way beyond our original charge. And as I told Richard in reviewing everything that had been put together to this point, um, I think it's we're ready to send it on uh, based on the the uh, the protocol that Sarah outlined at our last meeting. There's goodness gracious three to five more steps that um, these kind of changes in the code have to go through before they ever um, are are implemented. Not to include how long it'll take the city council to get through it. So. I think time's sort of of the essence. We need to get on with it. Um, I, again, I, I think that the modifications that we've made um, uh, for aesthetics are on track and are indeed an improvement, but let's face it, you can't move a manufactured home into this climate and without addressing actual building standards uh, expect it to last um, as long as a regular stick built home. And eventually it's gonna become an eyesore. So um, given the, the, the soft gloves that we've used to deal with the, the original issue, um, this continuing to expand the, the scope of what we were originally charged to do is sort of frustrating to me. Okay, Tanya? Give your hand up. Nope, I did not. Thank you. <laughs> that was my hand. Sorry. Richard? So, uh, Greg, I, I'm not sure that I agree with you on many of the issues that you bring up. And and I was sitting here as you were talking, trying to think to myself, okay, so where would we address things like the man lift parked in the front yard? Uh, and it could be in the nuisance ordinance. But I think that it may be just as appropriate here. The other comment that I would say on the work that we've done uh, is I think after reading through these ordinances actually a few times, I think that we have the, the bones of a, of a pretty good ordinance. And basically what we're doing is we're discovering, yes, the bones of our ordinances are good and they could stand a little bit of tweaking. And that's what we're doing right now is just tweaking where it needs tweaking and the end product, I think, will benefit the city. Uh, so that's just my two cents worth. Anybody else on general hours, or do we want to move on to uh, what was presented, what was being presented today? Okay, Tanya, I guess it's yours. 
Okay, thank you guys. Um, so Richard, I don't know if you wanna talk about what you put together uh, between the last meeting and now. Um, so I'm, do you wanna be leading this or do you? I, so I'm, I'm the, the note taker today, uh, but before you get started and if you follow my notes, I think it's quite appropriate that you perhaps lead this discussion. But what I would preface by saying is as we were close to adjourning in the last meeting, uh, you put out a request for help. And I didn't jump forward at that time because I wasn't sure I was ready to commit. And then as I started looking at what we're doing, I said, oh, I see a way to maybe simplify much of what we're doing. And it goes to what Marlene was talking about. Where do we put these changes? Um, and so I like the format of your document uh, that has the columns. Uh, I didn't make any changes to that document except a couple of places in red. And almost all of my changes are what chapter those changes listed should go in. Uh, on the other hand, the, in, this, in this notes that Greg refers to, I put a lot of changes and I put those uh, in red and I also had sidebar comments. But the big thing that I found is that, oh, let's see, 17.50.210, is that correct? I've got to get the right screen open. Um, seems to me to be the appropriate place for almost everything, except there was just a couple of things that were mobile or manufactured home specific. And as we go through this document, all of my notes are in red and all of my sidebar notes are there. Uh, and those notes say everything that you already have in front of you. And I don't see anything to be gained by us hashing through those one at a time, except that as a group to say, yes, this sounds good or no, it doesn't. And this would be better. Uh, um, and if Tanya, if you facilitated that discussion and then I can focus on taking notes and trying to keep up with the conversation, uh, that would be my preference. Okay, thanks, Richard. Um, okay, so just to recap, if I can share my screen here. Okay, so once we're once I can share my screen, I'll pull up the documents that we are talking about. But when we left the last meeting, we were actually discussing a minimum porch size for the primary entrance of a home. I don't know if you all remember that, but we had left off at that point. So maybe we could actually revisit that and and then go from there. Okay. I recall Eleanor having a suggestion. Yes. I've gotten the dimensions that you kind of had suggested, Eleanor. Um, I'm thinking it was a five by six. So about at least 30 square feet. Yeah. Okay, so if you can see the screen I just pulled up. Um, so let me start at the beginning. So this is the document that I put together as a proposed template for communicating with council regarding changes we're suggesting making to the code. This is a working document. It is something that we're actively changing as we make uh, decisions and discussion. So um, anyhow, we worked through a number of these items at the last meeting and we left off down at item number six with um, porches, decks, and patios. So did well, we- I've got, I've got a question for Pat. Being a builder, Pat, do you have a suggestion on a suggested size based on the way you have to buy wood the way it uh, ties into the roof line, those kinds of things. And you there, um, you know, if, if so, if we're trying to do say 30 square feet, so if you did a three by eight deck or a four by eight deck, four by eight would be what? 32. 32. 32. So eight foot is kind of the in increments that things come in. Okay. So you, you, you go eight foot, 10 foot, 12 foot, 
they go in two foot increments, but they start at eight foot. So that wouldn't put too big of a burden on it. So if you use eight as your starting point. Um, so we said so 32 can, square feet, that's four by eight. That, that's a sheet of plywood. It makes the dimensions maybe easier for the builders. Yeah, I mean, it's, although, are we talking, are we talking about all porches or are we talking about? Minimum porch, porch size. Back porch, all porches, I don't know. We're talking about the primary pedestrian entrance. So basically the front door. Gotcha, I, I, I wasn't part of that conversation. Sure, so. yeah. And we're talking about a covered porch or deck. Okay. So thinking about houses that we've built in the past, um, you know, I think the minimum would have been something like six by five. So that's 30, 30 square feet. So yeah, I think, I think that works. I really do. I think that's a good minimum. Our, our house was built just a few years ago and it has a five by six. And I would think that that would be the minimum. Anything else could actually be a safety hazard. You get something too small with a step off. So I, I would see the minimum as 30. But covered. So, so subjectively, I, I get that we would have a, an entrance deck, but I don't know about covering that. Right. Do we, do we want to cover the whole thing or do we just want um, some type of cover? Because we had this, we, we were requesting a covered front entrance and it says eave overhang alone does not constitute cover. So we're asking for more than just eaves, but we're so, not specifying how much of that has to be covered. So the way the code's written today is you can encroach into a setback, um, a third, with an uncovered porch. But if it's covered, it cannot be in the setback. So you have to consider that when you're doing your designs and whatnot, because um, you know if you're requiring somebody to build a 30 square foot deck, and then you cover it, well, now that can't be in the setback. That's got to be back behind the setback. So is that going to limit what people are able to do with their property? Don't most people have a cover over their front door? Not all, no. No, no, they don't. I mean, they're crazy if they don't, but they don't. Hmm. That's why we're addressing it here. Right. So, so Rich, Rich, your house before it was remodeled didn't have a covered porch. Correct. And you made me put a covered porch on it because you knew the planning commission was going to address this. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that was it. Way to plan ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, there's, there are a lot of homes out there that don't have covered porches. So, I, I, I mean, I'm all for it. I just want to make sure that, that, that we're considering everything on this. So my, my comment, uh, uh, Pat, I hear what you're saying about uh, square feet encroaching into the, the setback space, but I, I have a hard time visualizing where 30 square feet at the front entrance would ever impact the setback. And, and I think that we're all in agreement that having some type of cover immediately over the front entry door is is a good thing both aesthetically uh, and for longevity of that entryway, um, and so I was trying to say how would we word that that you have to have at least a thirty square foot section just <clears throat> above the front door covered, but the rest of it could be open deck or not uncovered deck or not the uh, you know the the the, the builders or the residents choice. Um, the other comment that I have on this part is as I was reading the actual code, and we don't have to go to that page, I have a note in it on, on the sidebar comments, but the way it was originally written, uh, when I first read it the first couple of times, I said, oh, you can't put a deck 
on a manufactured home that's less than 35 feet long. And, and then I reread that and finally said, what they really said is that the deck has to be 35 feet long, not the manufactured home. Uh, so as we get to that portion of what we're doing, um, you know, I just want to plant a seed. That we need to look at the way that that's actually worded. Eleanor? Um, to get back to the setback on the porch, not all front doors are on the front of the house. Mine is on the side of the house. The garage is on the front and you have to come past the garage, which puts, puts the front entry on the side of the house. So it is conceivable that there could be a setback problem. Unless we own or exclude the five by six cover over a five by six porch. I wouldn't think that would be a problem encroaching, but that's really, a, it's really only a problem if, uh, if they're not aware of the new rules. You know, if you're building a house, you would ad ad adapt to this. I guess the only point was it, it could get into a setback problem because not all front doors are on the front of the house. I agree. So the question I would ask is when the front door is on the side of the house, did the builder site the house in a way that there is more than a five foot setback to the side yard? And yes. you'll sign yes, the back. Well, the, the challenge is, is that, you know, you, there's some 50 foot lots out there, you design a 40 foot house. And if the, if the entrance is on the side, then it becomes problematic to cover it. So do you just take those plans and say, not, they're not going to work on a 50 foot lot? I mean, do we really care if they put a cover over the front door? Yes, we do. That was the whole point of how this meeting started. We were trying to adopt standards that would help all types of construction blend together. And some, some manufactured homes at this point haven't had this quality. Not just manufactured homes. Oh. I'm just not sure. I mean, I think it makes sense to put a cover over it. I'm just not sure we ought to be that picky about it. I, because with a narrow lot, we could be limiting people's ability to put what they want on the lot. And I don't think it really changes the character of the house that much. So my thought is, is when we went into this, we have two objectives. And one objective is to create an aesthetically pleasing neighborhood. And the other objective is, is to create a set of rules that uh, uh, will demand that structures be built uh, to withstand our better, uh, better to better withstand the severe weather conditions that we have here. So, so I agree with Rich Hartman. I think that demanding that we have this, this uh, 30 square foot covered porch over the front door. Um, and if, if uh, your building plan and your lot doesn't fit that, then I think you need to change your building plan um, uh, because we want to address both the aesthetics and the, the uh, uh, long-term livability of the structure. Uh, so I think that enforcing or mandating this porch helps both of those uh, uh, endeavors, aesthetics and long-term livability. Anybody else? I can't see everybody else there. I, I, I... I support what Richard just said. Now, we had talked about the covered porches for a long time. In different, in different times to the planning commission. So 
I, I, I agree with that. I think we ought to have covered courts. Now, does it have to be the whole courts has to be covered? I don't know if I think that's right, but how do you how do you do that? Pat, what's your thoughts on how much the court should be covered? Well, I mean, if we're going to set this thing up for 30 square feet, that's really not that much. So I'd say minimum square footage, 30, 30 square feet of porch and cover. And if they want to build the porch bigger, they build it bigger, but 30 square feet of it needs to be covered. Okay. Anybody have a problem with that? I think that's good. Okay, let's move on then. Well, so looking at item six, as it reads now, how would you how would you word this? Porches, decks, patios, a architecture of the primary pedestrian entrances must include a covered porch or deck with an area of at least 30 square feet to protect the entrance from the elements. Eve overhang alone does not constitute cover. So you need to take out deck because deck is not covered necessarily, porch is. By description. So, if, so okay, so, so on a manufactured home, which basically are big rectangles, how do you put a, um, how do you put a covered porch on this? And I, I know that's the reason we're doing this, but how do you put a covered porch on it so it looks right? We Did have you... a covered porch down the side that does not have a, a deck. It actually protrudes out with a roof over it, and it's architecturally the same as the house. And then you're That's in a, not... are you in a manufactured home? No. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Okay. Well... But the point is, you can make uh, an entryway with 30 square feet under cover and have it still architecturally pleasing. I think the past point was when you're building a stick house, that's easy. When you're trying to add a covered porch to a manufactured house, that's a little more challenging. Uh, uh, and I can visualize manufactured homes, but I don't have the carpentry skills uh, to quite visualize how I would tie that porch into. And I think that Pat has that background and skills. Um, uh, so what's, make a smarter Pat, I guess is what I'm saying. It's so, not unusual for cities to require uh, additional stick built structures on manufactured homes. City of Montesano demands a two car garage, a slightly more challenging than a 30 square foot porch. It, it, I'm not saying it's not doable. I'm just saying it's it's going to be a bit of a challenge because a, a, a manufactured home typically comes, let's just call it 24 by 50. And it's, it's a big rectangle and it's got a gabled roof on it, which is of say 312. And the entry on a manufactured home is typically on the side. Right, so somebody would have to build that porch structure and then tie it into the roof structure of the manufactured home. So, but that does serve the purpose of making um, manufactured homes look more like stick lift homes. So I don't think it's a bad idea. I'm just playing the other side of the card here and just saying, hey, if, if I have my heart set on a manufactured home, now I've got a challenge. I, there's, there's a manufacturer home I've got that drive that not only put on a two car garage, but it's covered on put on a covered porch also. And it looks really nice. Yeah. So what I'm hearing and I agree with is, is that it may be a challenge, uh, um, but the, to, to, to use an extreme example, we don't want people to put up uh, uh, um, yurts uh, with, with fur covered yurts to be permanent dwelling homes in the middle of the city. Uh, and so we're establishing those standards and it's up to the builder and the potential home 
buyer to adhere to the standards that we're demanding they adhere to for the reasons already stated, uh, both aesthetics and, and long-term livability. So, so in all fairness, out at Oeha, we have smaller lots than what are typical in, in uh, normal ocean shores. And all of our homes have covered porches and they're all at least 30 square feet. So I don't think this is unreasonable. All I'm doing is just playing the other side of it. And I agree with you. I don't think it's unreasonable. Okay. Let's figure out how to change the wording. Well, can you change the wording? And uh, I think we kind of beat this one to death. So let's move on. But let's let's get the wording right. Tanya. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Architecture of the primary pedestrian entrance. So one entrance um, must include a covered porch with an area of at least thirty square feet to protect the entrance from the elements, eave overhang alone does not constitute cover. So I think we just need to clarify that that covered area is supposed to be 30 square feet as well. Well, I think you did, a covered porch with an area of at least 30 square feet. Okay. I, I don't think you need to put in to protect the entrance from the elements. I, 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 I think that's irrelevant. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so we take that out. And then what about Eve overhang alone does not constitute cover, is that relevant? Yes, 100%, yeah. Okay. All right, so covered porch with an area, with a covered area, how about that? Hold on, I'd like to go back to that. Okay. So I have seen homes where they have their front door, may I say, inset into the house where they have a very large, hypothetically covered porch, but it's because they haven't pushed their front door out to the edge of the home. It's yeah. it's in by 10 feet. Well, that works though. So we, by what we just said, I think we just made those not acceptable. What? How do we feel about that? I think that's well, fine. I think the wording's still fine, Rich. It doesn't say that it makes it true. But when you say the word an eve doesn't count, technically, isn't that a just the eve? It's not a separate roof line. It's not an eve. It's it's still a porch. And it's covered. So yeah, I covered. Think, I think it, that works. So that's so that that's legal then the way we're describing this. Yeah. I'm, Okay. And Eve is is from the fascia line back to the sidewall. It's not okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So um, architecture of the primary pedestrian entrance must include a. Can it just say a covered area and remove the word porch? A covered area of at least thirty square feet. Or do we need the word porch? I'm not sure you need porch. Well, are they synonyms in, in this instance? So a covered area, <laughs> oh geez, could be like what you just described where it's, maybe it's concrete. <clears throat> I mean, I guess it's still a porch, but when I think of porch, I think of something that's jutting out from the house. I don't know if this is relevant. I might just be <laughs> making things too complicated. So, as I'm visualizing what, what you're saying, Tanya, uh, uh, we've already said, stipulated in the code, that manufactured and, and uh, um, uh, mobile homes, as well as stick boat homes, all have to have a crawl space, which means that they have to be elevated, so you can't walk out your front door onto the gravel ground. Uh, so anything that's elevated above the, the, the level of the, of the yard is a porch. Um, uh, so I think that leaving this just like it is works just fine. Uh, okay, I'm good with that. Are you guys all good with that? Mm -hmm. Okay, now regarding the current code allowing a um, encroaching, I don't know what code that is and I don't know if it's relevant to the changes we're trying to make. So that's something we'll need to research a little more um, if, if you think that it is important. I don't, okay. I think 
I think if we do this, then it is what it is. And, okay, um, so we can not worry about that. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna delete that comment then. Um, and then it sounds like we're talking about moving all of the changes to 17.50.210. Is that correct, Richard? I'm, I'm confused where you're at right now. Sorry, I'm jumping around. I was looking at column two. Uh, so we figured out that we want 30 square feet of porch. And then the question is, where do we put this in the code? And 5210. OK, and so you're saying that for most of our recommendations, we actually add them all at 175210. That's exactly correct. And the only okay. exception to that, my memory is that, that item number one on this, and maybe item number two, uh, applies to specifically to manufactured or mobile homes. But this about porches ap applies whether it's a stick, manufactured, or mobile. Uh, and so everything that is uh, that applies everywhere, I think, belongs in, in, in 1750.210. Okay. All right. Um, all right. So just to remind everyone what we're talking about, column two is supposed to provide the current code and where we were recommending putting the revisions in so that council could compare side by side what the heck we were trying to change. Um, okay. So moving back to item six, I think we're good there. So we do have this question. If you look in column two where it's highlighted here under item six, we have our little special section for manufactured homes, R6C. And I think we might want to do something with this language under item H about decks, awnings, porches, entries, outbuildings, carports are permitted of a style compatible with the main structure. So it just says they are permitted. It does not say they are required. Good point. So do we want to require the same covered porch in that particular zone? Yes. And, and, and I would say that's what we're saying in the left-hand column is that all homes have to have a minimum of a 30 square foot covered entryway. And I'm wondering, as I just say that, I wonder if covered primary entryway is better than covered porch. Uh, if that language is more, more, uh, more concise. Um, so, in my mind, as I look at the at the yellow highlighted in the uh, in the middle column there, I'm not sure that that applies anymore because our requirement for covered entryways is universal. So it's not an exception. There's not. There's not. There's. There's no change because it's a manufacturer mobile home. Okay. So just to confirm, if it's seventeen point five zero point two one zero, it applies to every single residential structure, regardless of the zoning area. Correct. Okay. And so you're saying we could say just primary primary pedestrian entrance must include a covered area. A, a covered. Say that again. What you just said. Um, so if we start at the top, item A, architecture of the primary pedestrian entrance must include take out a porch with A, and it would just say must include a covered area of at least thirty square feet. I I I, I personally like that. Yes. We're good with that. Everybody likes that. Yep. All okay. right. Wonderful. So I'm going to delete that. We've got that. And then we're suggesting that we insert that into 17.50.210 along but, with all these other things. Before we go on, yes. uh, we, we never had a discussion about whether everybody agrees with me that virtually all of these changes we're proposing belong in 1750-210. Um, um, and right. so I'd like to ask that question, how do the rest of you feel? Instead of having a, a bit here and a bit there uh, and covering all of the various residential zones, that they're all just inclusive in that specific spot, 50.210. 
So Richard, I think it might be helpful to pull up the other document in order to show I, people what that looks like. I agree. Um, maybe, okay, so if I pull that document up, um, can you guys see this now? It's a, it's a different document. Um, I'm not exactly sure how to display this. So we're gonna have to work through this together, but this is uh, Richard's, so this is Richard's document that he created for us. Thank you so much, Richard. And uh, we've got the building standards. We've got Richard's kind of overview of where we're at. So you guys can read this. This was sent out by Dan last week. So Richard is saying that so if you're looking at the top of the page with me here, he realized that code 17.50 point whatever applied to all zones except as noted and that 17.50.210 architectural features was the appropriate placeholder for code modifications that applied to all zones. So Scrolling down here, a few things became apparent. All right, so we would kind of, I'm trying to find where we would. If you go down, it's on page four. Of the okay. Room, uh, and it starts with 1750 uh, miscellaneous provisions. And then it's A, 17.50.210 architectural uh, features. And then the things that are in black are already in 17510, and the things that are in red are all of the items that I took off of the first document and added to 175210. Thank you. That's awesome. Okay, so did everyone follow that? Okay. I, I have a question about the intent. Richard, what about in the certain areas on the northern side of town that are zoned for Literally, I can pull my camper in there if I wanted to. And, to and those are an exception. And, and the, the I, that's Ordinance 176A, I think, uh, um, that allows campers. And, and so that ordinance uh, doesn't include these because that ordinance says it, uh, that, that it's campers only. And I'd have to go back and reread that. But, uh, um, I just want to make sure that those northern communities aren't or zones aren't affected by this. And, and that is my intent. They are not affected by this. And as we get deeper into the to the actual code, uh, that we meet, need to make sure uh, that I didn't inadvertently include those campers where I didn't intend to. I don't think I did, but. Uh, um, I can use help at making sure. Okay, so um, did we get all of our items in this then? I did put all of the items in here. Okay, so we had however many. A bunch. All right, so then if you look at this, it seems very straightforward to just present this to city council and say we're recommending adding these however many items um, into this code. So if we did it just like this, are there other places in the current code that we need to clean up or change? So, so my suggestion, Tanya, uh, uh, first I think that you're doing a su superb job at, at uh, uh, leading this discussion. My suggestion is we continue to go through your first document because that quantifies what we're looking at and changing. And I took the existing changes that you gave me from the last meeting and put them into this document where you're just looking at right now. Uh -huh. uh, if we make any changes to the original document, uh -huh. my plan is, is you will record those changes, email them to me, and I will modify this word document to reflect the changes we discussed today. Awesome, okay. All right, well, I think that we need to, is everyone okay with this idea of everything becoming 17.50.210? Sure. Sure, yeah, okay. Um, so we need to clean up this um, table, take the column two that's supposed to be our edits and 
basically just keep Richard's change to 17.50 and then insert the specific language that we're talking about. Um, I'm, I'm trying to recall if we had, we were at item seven and I believe we got through all of these things. No, we, no, we, we did not. We did not, okay. So, so a thing that you just said just a moment ago, when we present this to city council, uh, because everything now is being put under 210, that I'm not sure that this document on the screen uh, is still a meaningful document. It, it tracks the history of how we got to where we got to. Uh, and Sarah, I would ask you, what's your opinion? Does this document um, enhance the city council's discussion or does it confuse the city's council discussion? And if we just present the, uh, um, um, the document that was previously on the screen, the, the notes and changes. Um, and then I would say, rather than even give the city council the, the original ordinance, if we just gave them this notes and changes, however we decide to, 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 to title it and say, this is what we're proposing to be changed. You know, all the changes are in red and, and then it's up to the city council to rewrite the code because they're gonna rewrite no matter what we give them according to what Sarah told us last week. Mm -hmm. last week. Did that I make think, sense? I think I followed you. I think it makes sense. I think this table, uh, the table that we're looking at is still useful with some pretty serious editing. Um, so I like the idea of this format and our working draft just needs to be cleaned up to be a final draft before we give it to council. Um, and I think because we're just saying we're gonna create a whole new section of code, that change to 17.50.210, and then you could just put item H or whatever it is in there, and then they could refer to your narrative document. Correct. Uh, so I think that's fine. I, I guess, my, I, do we need to make sure that these changes we're proposing don't conflict with other parts of the code or does the code publishing service do that for us? Well, it, the first, first of all, everybody has to remember, we, we send it to the mayor. Yes. Pushes it on to her, to the city employees. And that's the first edit we get. So, um, I, I think what we've done is fine. I don't think we have to necessarily make sure everything isn't in another code. Or something. I, don't, I don't know. No, okay. I think as long as no one has a different opinion, that makes sense. Okay. All right. So we started talking about sheds we've i don't know that we've really settled on this whole shed question but we we seem to all be comfortable saying a limit of three accessory structures per house um and they do not have to match the architecture of the house itself okay did we come to an agreement with that i believe we did well, what we're saying now on seven uh, dot two is architectural style of a detached garage shop or shed must match the style of the primary structure. So I think that we need to come to consensus on this language. Well, I, I think Rich brought up the fact that there's lots of pre-made sheds that are some kind of a poly uh, material that probably 50% of the people are using, and there's no way to make that architecturally compatible. And I don't think we want to limit people so they can't go out and buy an inexpensive yet halfway attractive shed for the gardening tools. Yeah, just, even, a, even a greenhouse wouldn't qualify technically. So well, we, yeah. we have at the bottom, this standard is not applicable to greenhouses or open-sided structures intended only to cover recreational vehicles or woodsheds or structures <laughs> intended to screen utility connections or garbage cans. And, and Eleanor, I, I, I very much agree with what you're saying. Uh, um, and maybe we 
need to say something like, if it's a stick built uh, addition, it needs to match the architecture of the house. But if it is a metal or a plastic structure, it is what it is. I don't think we should punish people that actually build their own shed. <laughs> if they want to build a cool, crazy shed, if we're going to let other things fly, I think we should just let it fly. Well, I think a lot of people are building studios, and most of them are smart enough to have them match the house. So, you know, it's one thing to have a shed that doesn't match the house. It's another thing to build a huge studio that sticks out like a sore thumb. I think we should differentiate. How should we do that? Is there some other way to term accessory building? Because I think there's, in my mind, there's a difference between accessory building and a storage shed. I know a lot of people who've built a studio, which is a stick built structure that matches the house. And it's quite frankly, it's very attractive, but I think that's a far cry from a garden shed. Didn't we say something about if they were accessory buildings that needed a building permit, they needed to match? If they didn't need a permit, then we were leaving them alone? My understanding is people can build a studio without a permit. If it's the right size. If it's under a certain size. Right. And I, that's correct. I think anything under 200 square feet does not require a building permit. I'm, I'm questioning that. I'm questioning that size, Richard. I, I was. I've been. I haven't seen the facts, but I'm led to believe that that's not true. If it's on a vacant lot, that it's limited to to less than that on a vacant yes, lot. Yes, it. That's correct. Okay. What is it on a vacant lot? Is just like a eight by ten or something, or? Yeah, eight by ten or eight by eleven. We talked about this a few meetings back, so if anybody remembers <laughs> that. I thought the vacant lot was 120 square feet, uh, was the maximum size of a it's smaller a than that. Without a permit, and then on a lot that you already have a house, it was a 10 by 20, correct? 200 square feet, correct. That's, that's my memory, um, uh, and I can't take those to pay attention to this and look that up. If somebody else has an extra hand and wants to go ahead and look at that code, uh, um, that would probably be helpful. Right. How do we move through I, this? I, I got the information. I, I got it. Um, they plan only eight by 10 is allowed. Um, and it has to be reviewed by the building department. That's as today. And then no limit on sheds, no limit on the amount of sheds with a house. And sheds can be up to 200 square feet without a permit with the house, any okay. side variations. So you said eight by 10 on the- uh, uh, vacant. Uh, vacant lot. A vacant lot. So that's only 80 square feet. Correct. And it can only have one window, one door, and it cannot be hooked up to power. Is that 10 by 20 allowed to be hooked up to power? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's with a house. So the rules change when you have a, a house on, on the lot. Then yeah. there, today there is currently no limit to the amount of sheds that you can put on. And um, they can be up to 20, 200 square feet, any dimension. With so electrical. Can, with, yeah, electrical. Do they allow you plumbing? Can't you can't live in them. Do they allow plumbing? Yes. Uh -huh. I'm sure because I my memory is uh, that as soon as you add water or electric, uh, that it has to have a permit. Uh, and the intent behind that was to prevent people from building an accessory structure that that gets under the table used as a living structure. I don't think the electrical is in the permit. But I could be wrong, but I don't remember that. So they can have power, but no water, and they don't I, need permit? I believe so. I'm pretty confident they can have power. 
So Tanya, you might put a note in there uh, on the sidebar, check to see. Well, the, po the power has to be permitted through Elma. Electricity on a, on a 200 square foot shed on a, uh, um, on an occupied lot. Richard, how, anything you'd put power on, anything at all, has to be permitted through l and I. I agree, Pat. I'm just saying that that this is a discussion that I could lose track of. And a sidebar note, a, you know, a, a, a word comment note over there, uh, then I know that when I'm looking at it, I will remember to go and look up the code, which is too cumbersome for me to try to do in the midst of this, of this discussion. Um, and all I'm saying is, yeah, let's just put a note so we remember to look up what the code says about electricity and water in an accessory structure. Well, you, you know, guys, we're getting into minutiae. <laughs> we just, yeah, that's all we're talking about. We're not talking about putting power and water to them. That's a whole other issue, and I don't think we want to go there. That's already in the code. We have to have a permit to get that done. We had our heat pump changed out. We had to get a permit just to change the heat pump out because they had left it. So uh, anything that is permitted, water and power, I don't think we address. Dan, I think you're absolutely correct, and thank you for the, you know, for the for the reminder and and the insight. Uh, power and electricity in all cases require a permit, and and we don't have to address that because it's already addressed in the in the permit code. I, I think you're absolutely correct. So, do we just want to say limit of three unpermitted accessory structures per house, and then we can make a note unpermitted. Access, okay, oh wait, how about this? Um, structures under 200 square feet are, mm -mm, do not require a permit. They'll need to address whether they have to match the house or not. Yes. I, I'm not in favor of that personally. Uh, we, we talked extensively, I think last time and, and I was one of the ones that was pushing me through and I agree now that there's some beautiful sheds out there that don't even come close to the like house that um, you can buy and they bring in and they're all built and everything. So yeah, I, I, I think we agreed to drop that and ask real quick. Okay, are we all in favor of just crossing out and, and getting rid of that requirement that they must match the house? Yes. Okay. Yes. Everyone says yes, okay. Speak now or hold your face, okay. Okay, so second sentence there, the standard is not applicable to greenhouses or open-sided structures intended only to cover recreational vehicles or woodsheds or structures intended to screen utility connections or garbage cans. We're okay with that? If we took out the first sentence, then the second sentence has no meaning. No, it still does because we're saying you can only have three unpermitted accessory structures per house. We don't want to count greenhouses and carports and woodsheds as part of those three structures. Uh, I didn't read it that way. So what you're saying, and I'm clarifying for my own, you know, for, uh, uh, what you're saying is I could have three art studios and a wood house. And, and a, a greenhouse and a carport, yep. And a carport. But I'm okay with that. I just want to make sure that that's what we're all Wanting to say, well, you, you end up in, running into the area of coverage. Exactly, and and I think the area of covers, the area of coverage, uh, uh, would limit how many structures can be put up. So so I, I I think that we're all right, and I think that Tanya was correct, and I was short sighted. Uh, we we eliminate the first sentence and leave the second sentence, but I think that the second sentence wording could be better a little bit better so that it's clear that this is an exception to the three structure limit and and i'm having a hard time okay. seeing, so i can't think how to okay like, what if we said greenhouses open-sided structure okay blah 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 sorry if we say greenhouses or open-sided structures intended only to cover 
recreational vehicles or woodsheds or structures intended to screen utility connections or garbage cans do not count as uh, do not do not count toward the limit restructure limit okay are we okay with that i like that personally i think we're getting better <laughs> anyway I, I do want to point out though that you guys talk about the total area that is allowed to be covered on your lot yes if you've, if you've built your home and then you put up your three auxiliary non-permit needed structures there is nobody on the planet that's going to call you out for having of course it yeah I agree. I was thinking the same thing, but that's not, is that important here? <laughs> do we, do we want to try? Just pointing it out that that maximum coverage will not actually apply. Yeah. I wonder if it's even being enforced at all. Even when people apply for a permit, I wonder if it's actually being enforced. Yeah, Pat, Pat would know that. Has anybody ever called you out, Pat, for how much of a piece of land you're covering with structure when it's new? Uh, just when they do the plan review. So when we do a plot plan, you have to put that information on the, on the plot plan. And um, it, so that would be the only time, but that doesn't apply to this because once the structure's up or the house is up, then a person can put up as many sheds as they want. Yeah. And nobody's gonna stop them because they don't have to get a permit. Yeah, this would be hard to enforce, wouldn't it, if there's no permit required? There's still a limit to how much of the land you can cover. And I think we ought to uh, put something in there that says that. I mean, there's still a limit. There has to be so much open land. Just remind people? Yeah, I think. OK. Per whatever code that is. I don't like that. Per code link um only oh uh, bum, bum, bum. i can't the maximum there's a i don't remember the exact code i was thinking 40 percent, but i'm not 100 percent sure on that yeah I, right eleanor but i don't remember the code either Okay, so I'll just highlight that as something that needs to be cleaned up. Okay. So we're comfortable with this the way we are. We're going to try to enforce, or we're going to try to impose a three, three shed limit. <laughs> what this gives is it gives the enforcement official an opportunity if there's five rundown sheds on a property to go in and um, have a little more punch and you've got to get rid of two of these sheds and these two that are broken down would be the ones to go. Just look around town. Okay. Anybody else? Any thoughts? Okay, what about carports? Do we want to get into carports or do we just want to leave that alone for now? I would like at some point to get into these carports that look like a tent on two story stilts. You mean like a pool building? Well, uh, sorry. I'm not sure what they're called, but they're kind of a, a tent, just to just to cover uh, just the top of it. Is the oh, that, that, we, we excluded that. That would be a um, oh, what the heck did we say? Open-sided structures intended only to cover recreational vehicles. I think is what you're talking about. And possibly a full building. Yeah, I think you're right. I had a discussion with uh, um, the woman in the permitting department. I can't think of her name right now. Nettie. 
Right, Nettie. Uh, and and I was and continue to think about uh, uh, a tent to cover my outside car. Um, I, I don't have room in the garage and I frankly can't afford a, a 10 or $15,000 uh, garage. Uh, and the whole carport issue and getting a carport, a middle carport that meets the 130 mile per hour sus uh, sustained wind. Uh, so, so to cut to the chase, according to the existing code, I could put up a 200 square foot car tent. The existing code lets me do that. And I think that that's what Eleanor is talking about, but I'm not positive. I think they look terrible, particularly when they're on the front of a building. And I have seen them on a street in town where there's a double one in front of the, uh, the house. Well, according to the, the, the maximum size is 200 square feet. And, and there's two challenges, keeping it from kiting away in the wind and making it look like something better than a $160 Costco car tent. And, and, and what we're addressing right now is aesthetics. And my point is, right now, my memory of my conversation with Nettie is that a resident can put up a, a 10 by 20 carport tent. Eleanor, look on the bright side. At least they're going to have a front porch now. <laughs> Maybe on the side. Okay. Are we are we just wanting to leave that alone for now, or do we want to dig into this idea of carports? I'd like to dig in, but I think I might be alone on this. I just feel like maybe we're not prepared for that. <laughs> Sorry. I make a motion that I'm too chicken to handle this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I'll add that this is a good illustration of us getting way beyond our original scope. Well, it makes sense to discuss it while we're looking at similar things, but I think, I just feel like we're not prepared. We don't really, understand the current codes very well, and I'm not sure what we're trying to achieve. I would just at some point like to discuss it. It does not have to be at this point, because I do agree with Greg, we need to move on and get this done. It's been a huge project and thank you, Tonya. Yeah, and again, <laughs> It's going to be six months before, at, at a minimum, before yeah. this ever gets codified. All the lots will be built out and we won't need to worry about it. Okay. Um, so moving on. So we talked about screening. I thought we did a really good job of that last time. We, I remember we wordsmithed that quite a bit. I thought we did a great job. I appreciate the uh, voice from the public. Yeah, but uh, we we went over this really well. So Pat, I don't know if you were around for that conversation. I can't remember at what point you had to go. Do you have any concerns about what we've written for the screening requirements? No, no, I'm good with the screening requirements. Okay. And, you know, the public comment that came back earlier um, about uh, enclosing propane tanks. Um, we do it all the time at Oya and with no issues at all. And so, you have very small lots, yeah. Yeah, and you know, I mean, I don't think our intent it was to screen the utility boxes that are sitting out in the street. We're just talking about trying to do a best job to hide the candy canes, the um, you know, heat pump condensers and things like that. I, you know, I don't know if we need to be more descriptive of that or what, but, but that's the whole idea is just to make those things not be so prevalent when you're driving by a house. Right. Okay. And this would apply to existing structures or would it only I be- don't, I don't see how you could do that. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I, I have a comment on screening that, that uh, I had a conversation with the electric meter reader uh, and I'm not, I don't remember whether it was in this community or a different community, but particularly when there's fear of dogs in the yard, I have known electric meter readers uh, to, to, to read the meter with a, with a spyglass uh, uh, from, you know, from outside the fence. And if we screen that meter, now that doesn't happen. Is that a problem? That's why we need the builders to put the meters on the side so it's not on the street face. Well, sometimes that's realistic and sometimes it's not, Rich, because sometimes if you're putting them on the side and there's a garage in the way, it's going to cost thousands of dollars to run that extra wire to get them up and over the top of the garage and down into the meter base. So okay. what you're talking about could be a significant financial burden. I don't really, I personally don't really have an issue with the, with the, um, meter base being in the front of the house. It, it just, if it's, if somebody paints everything but the meter, the same color as the house, it pretty much goes away anyway. But, but I think what you're talking about could cost a lot of money if, if we make it, make that a requirement. The, at least I have, having them screened with shrubbery would be helpful. I heard what Richard said, but. Well, my, my experience, and that's the case in my house right now, is is the uh, the conduit that runs up to the meter is painted the same color as the house. Uh, um, and the meter just fades away. It, 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 it just doesn't stick out. Uh, um, and I can understand that meter reader not wanting to go into a yard for fear of a dog. I, I, I totally get that. I've been bitten three times. Dogs can smell fear, Richard. <laughs> and that may be it. And, and I'm concerned about big fangs. Well, I think most of the meters are actually run, read um, electronically. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I don't, I, at least in my neck of the woods, they are. I guess I'm thinking, you know, we're not unique. Every community has meters. So I feel like maybe this particular detail is not something we should even really tackle. And I don't know, maybe our language needs to clarify that. I don't know. I thought we achieved the original intent of why we even started this project and meters on the front of the house were one of the big issues that are out there with, with some homes. Uh, plant screening was a natural. You guys are right. Covering up the meters with paint other than the, the face is, is very, very helpful. But just to ignore this isn't in tune with what we started this whole project for. Okay. And just for edification, so everyone knows, only about one third of the meters in the city of Ocean Shores are electronically read meters. About oh, two really? thirds of them do have to be checked manually. For the uh, uh, for the electric. And what is the plan for? Oh no, not for the, not no not for electric for um, for water. For water, yeah, water. Electric. electric. Yeah, the water meters are at the road, right? So we don't we don't see those. Yeah, they're not on the, yeah, so you don't, but I just wanted to let you know that people think that the meter reading is all done uh, electronically, it's not. Thank you. That's good to know. Pat, do you know what PUD is doing? Are they electronic now? As far as I know, um, they're, yeah, they're all electronic now. So this is a moot point anyway. Yep. We can screen them and nobody's going to need their binoculars. Do we need to confirm with PUD? I mean, <laughs> how far do we need to go with our due diligence here? I, I, <laughs> guys, I personally think that screening a meter is, is I, I don't think that's, personally, I just, I think that's taken a little bit too far. We'll just stick in there after all mechanical, except PUD okay. and get on with it. Okay, how about this? Okay, all mechanical equipment, including public utilities, except for those 
portions allowing meter reading or routine uh, routine maintenance. No, that doesn't help. Something like that. <laughs> uh, I just how about how like, about when possible? How about that? When possible. <laughs> if can be the way it is, <laughs> and screen them when possible. Something. That's Again, that's the, too open ended, isn't it? I mean, I. I well, you, it's better. It's better than what you have now, which is now giving everybody the right to not do a damn thing to it. But we are still. I mean, everybody could say, "Well, it's it's just not possible." I don't know. I'm just. I, 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 again, there's going to be five levels of review after we send this on. One, including city employees. We so, cannot assume that other people will fix our mistakes. That we should do the best we can before we send it on. Well, I'm an eighty twenty guy, and I don't agree with that. <laughs> okay. I, we're we're going to spend eighty percent of our time trying to fix twenty percent of the problem. And then so, miss the boat. Yeah, I hear. So you. at any rate, again, uh, time is of the essence. We're really trying to get some standards out there that will deal with manufactured homes. Well, this uh, was one of the biggest things. Trust me, when you buy, when you drive by one, take a look and notice. I get it. I've driven by a lot. We, okay. we yeah. you know, we did a field trip, and I understand it. Um, how, about, how about this? At the very end, we say meters requiring routine visual access do not yeah. need to be screened. Okay. Is that okay? Yep. For the hypothetical mean dog in the front yard. Okay, let's move on. Thanks, guys. Okay, and we're moving on. I think we got. It. Oh, and then lighting. We worked through the lighting. I thought we were happy with that. Um, the front and side yard uses. I think we're good with this as well if we can just put this into the 17.50.210. Um, so just if you need to read that, let me know. I don't want to go too fast for you guys. So basically we're saying no portable anything unless it's a short term situation and they need to be gone within 72 hours. We're good with that. I will take that as a yes. Okay, moving on. I think that was the end of it. Okay, so what that means is we go back to Richard's document and we revise this with the things that we tweaked today. The biggest one would be the um, sheds, I believe. So I can go through and make sure that this language in Richard's document reflects the language in the document that we collectively worked on today. I can also take these items and insert them into column two for each specific change so that council can see that. I think the remaining question in my mind is, do we need to go through and correct anything else within the code or, or can we just leave it at the 17.50.210 and call it good? So, so my only comment, and it goes back, I already mentioned this, uh, on item K yes. of this document, uh, um, I reworded that uh, oh. because it was, uh, um, uh, to well, we we reworded it again today. So during the meeting, we talked about that. So that's going to get changed again. Uh, that was where item six, wasn't it? Seven. Wait, sorry, I'm I got distracted. Okay, so oh, cord porches, right? Okay, so we're back on porches, item six. Okay, 
I see Anne has a comment. Are we, we're almost through this, Anne, and then I think we'll open it up to comment again. If, if we can give a comment if you want. Yeah, okay. So we would just take this that we worked on today and plop that in there. Is, uh, well, you can't see my screen. Sorry, I forgot. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, so Rich, that item K is going to become um, item six as we wrote it today. Perfect. Okay. All right, so then, so the next step is revise Richard's uh, narrative version, revise this, this table document. I basically think I'm erasing everything except columns one, two, and three. I think that's correct. Let me go back up to the top here. So we're all looking at the headings. Um, so basically, we're going to submit this to council. We're going to have column one, which refers to the item number, column two, which is the proposed revision, column three, which is supposed to reference the current code, but we're actually not changing current code. We're proposing all new code. So um, I'll revise this to say um, where to... Well, this doesn't make sense. Okay, so we've got the revision and we've got where we're going to put it into the code and I'll, I'll revise these headings so they reflect that. And then um, we have Richard's item in red, which is basically change everything except for this item number one into a new item in 17.50.210. I'm gonna remove the related code column because it doesn't sound like we need that. And I'm gonna remove the PC comments column because the city council doesn't need to see that either. That was just for our use as we work through the discussion. And then I'll leave this approved revision. Should I leave that so they can use this as a working? They, I think Tanya, they can create their own format for how they're going to review and approve the revisions. Right. Maybe we show this and offer it to them and they can say, we don't want that. I don't know, just. I remember we give it to the mayor. Right. Okay, so that's where I think we need to go. Um, we, you might remember last time we had created a cover letter or not a cover letter, but like a, an overview page that just gave a, a basis statement for why we were making these recommendations for each item. And I need to find that. Oh, where would that be? Page one, is that it? Okay. Sorry guys, I don't have that pulled up. I'm gonna have to find that. Um, and then the final step would be to actually write a cover letter. I think we should write a cover letter that just very, very briefly is like a memo form that says, this is what we did, this is why, and these are the items included in this packet. Who's going to write the cover letter? I could I could draft it and then send it out to you guys for a review. Does so that work? What I'm hearing is if you draft a cover letter and send it out, we have to have one more meeting before this can be released to the mayor. Uh, um, Do we have to have a meeting, or could? If, if we if 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 we approve a cover letter, we're having a meeting, whether we do it in the open like this or whether we do it through email, mm -hmm. it's, it's a violation of the Public Meetings Act. Well, in the past, Dan has simply verbally spoken to the mayor. So maybe this time we don't include a cover letter and we just carry on with the verbal tradition. I don't know, that's a decision for- Well, this, I, I think everybody wants to approve the final draft of what I'm hearing there's some changes to be made. So we can have a quick meeting on this. And if we want to do a cover letter, that'd be fine. We could probably get it done within 10, 15 minutes and then move on to whatever our next subject is, which I don't know what it is. So I'll have contact to make them get that. So why don't we do that so we all file it together? But I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. Just go over the quick changes and let's go. So, okay with that? Uh, yeah. I 
that. Tanya's oh. going to draft a cover letter. Uh, she's going to present both of these revised documents. Uh, and, and Tanya, any editing changes you make to my notes and you know, whatever I call that, notes and whatever, your revised doc changes you make to that, I'm all good with that. I, I do not get emotionally attached to, to those kinds of things. Okay, thank you. Uh, um, uh, and it's easier for one person to drive the boat than to have three skippers or two skippers. Uh, uh, so change it, present it at the next meeting. Uh, we will all have read your changes. Uh, and then as Dan said, we can just say, thumbs up, let's go. Uh, and then we're moving on to whatever's next. Perfect. Um, Richard and Dan, do you want to look at the packet I put together between now and the next meeting so that you can give me a, some feedback on it before we all meet on it? Sure, we can do that. Thanks. Okay, and Greg. Okay, okay, awesome. Moving forward, I'm giving it back to you, Dan. Okay, um, Anne, you have a comment? Uh, actually, yeah, um, just real quick. I gave most of it to Tanya in a chat message. Oh, uh, I know she was struggling with wording. So I looked up the uh, International Residential Code, which is adopted by Washington with the exception of, you know, they've got some amendments to it, but they didn't amend the areas that we're actually talking about. And so um, the uh, IRC 2018, Chapter 3. Um, we, do, so we, don't, we don't use IRC 2018, okay. we use 2015. Okay, well, um, according to what I found online, Washington State has gone up to 2018, but that neither here nor there. It's just about the language. So everybody, she was kind of struggling with how to word a porch and describe it. And in the code book, they actually refer to it as landings rather than a porch. Oh. Um, and in if, if you follow the, the sure. links, I quoted exactly what some of them are, and there was one that I didn't quote and that talks about how to attach it so that it's actually at the front door and not, you know, someplace else um, or separate of the structure. And so that's that's in there too for, it says exterior landing, six balconies, so on, shall be positively anchored to the primary structure to resist both vertical and lateral forces. Um, so just what I gave you in the chat, uh, it, it, it describes the minimum standard. So we're, you were writing in there 30 square feet leaving my opinion about 30 square feet out, the code book requires a minimum uh, width uh, to, to equal that of the door opening or the door itself and a minimum depth, which is your dimension in the path of travel of 36 inches. Um, so obviously 30 square feet is more than that, but the key is, is that path of travel being 36 inches. That would keep somebody from making their front porch two feet by, you know, 15 feet in order to get the 30. Uh, you've got to have that 36. So those are those are some key things that if we're going to describe 30 square feet, we want to make sure that that they're meeting the rest of whatever applicable code is out there. So and and it's best if we use the language of those code books, which is landings. That it also is, talks about the elevation of those landings. Okay, that's helpful. Um, so that's all. I just wanted to, to pass that info on for your wording on this, just to be consistent. Thank you. So, You're welcome. I got to go to the appointment. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Anne. So my comment on what Anne has just said is, is she's given that information to Tanya in a chat, and I'm perfectly okay with Tanya incorporating that chat. I understood what, what Anne was saying. Tanya incorporates that into this document uh, and, and it comes back for our final approvement, approval at our next meeting. I'm good with that and, and, and I don't know if that needs a thumbs up around or, or whatever, um, but I thought that those comments were valid and germane. Thanks. I'm, I'm at, I opened it up into the screen so you guys should all be able to see her comments now. I, I'm not sure exactly how we'd use them yet, but at least we're all looking at the same thing. Well, my thought is, Tanya, is as, as you are making the edits that you're making, uh, then you incorporate these as looks appropriate. Um, um, and as Pat pointed out, we're not quoting the IRC, we're just quoting 
are using the language so that we're consistent uh, with the state. Right. So it would be easy to say 30 white feet with the um, width dimensions being not less than 36 inches. Does everybody, anybody have a problem with using landing versus port? Yes, I like that. I like that too. Covered landing. Covered landing, exactly. Pat? I, you know, so the code already says it's got to be 36 inches out. Um, which is the direction of travel out of the door. Um, we're saying that, so I don't believe that we're trying to change the IRC. I don't think we can. But what we can say is that that's got to be covered. Um, but I don't think doing it in this code is the right place to do it. Well, it wouldn't be in the code. It would be taking the language of the code and putting it into our edits to the city ordinance so that we're using the same vocabulary. Okay, exactly. What that is, in our current code, do they talk about porches and landing? Sorry, Dan. In our current code, do they talk about porches or landings? It, yeah. it, the, the current code does, is that, it, it does say 36 inches measured in the direction of crap. The building is, code, but not the city code, right? Well, but we adopted the building code, so it by default is the city okay. code. Okay, okay. So I guess we're done with this, right? <laughs> but it doesn't talk about covered in our building code. So we're adding that. We're adding that. Okay, I will add the word landing and I will not worry about the rest of it because it's already in the building code. Is that fair? Yes. Yep. Okay, perfect. All right, um, cool. Okay, I guess we can go to reports now. We can go to what? I couldn't hear you. Go to reports now. And I have one. I'm reporting to you guys. Uh, the mayor did send me an email about the homeless shelters going, being allowed to B1, B2, and B3 zones. And she asked me if, since the plan commission had written, uh, worked on it extensively, if we wanted to be part of the changes. And I said no. I didn't follow what you just said, Dan. Can you repeat that? Sure. In how homeless shelters can go in B1, B2, and B3, the mayor wanted to know, because we did all the work on them, what we gave them, um, did we want to be part of the chain and revisit it? And I said, no. It's a simple change. The council can do that by themselves. We don't need to be involved. I agree. And she agreed with it. But it was a council person's request that, that they contact the planning commission. So it, it's only a change of where it goes. We had a hard time deciding where it goes anyway. We couldn't all agree on that. So the rest is fine. So let's, we'll let them make the change. I agree. I, I, I agree. The, the state has said they can, they can put it up anywhere that, 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 that there's a motel. Uh, and the the actually more than that residential as well no no not not with b1 two and three no we're talking about state state laws that have changed since we discussed creating special b districts so that's what the state legislation did said that we're all any hotel goes uh homeless we could go which is b1 B2, B3. Yeah, but that's not in a residential area. No. 
residents could be in that area, but it's not zoned residential. Okay. Well, okay. nice. Anybody got anything else? Uh, I got an idea for a future topic. Maybe. Okay. Uh, back in 2017, when we were working through this particular item uh, on building uh, designs, we also made recommendations for some changes in zoning in the city. And I don't know what the status of that is. I don't know if uh, um, I don't know if it was forwarded to the city council, or if there's something that we needed to do in addition to what we did back then. Eleanor, you probably remember us going over the map and making recommendations for zoning changes well, throughout that, the city. It, it, I don't think we can do anything until they pass the pop up. Do we well, that, still that's have a, that, that map? We had a huge map that we marked up. Do we right. still have that? Right. So that's a technical question, Dan, then, because the city, as I understand it, is going through the comp plan on a, on a chapter by chapter basis. Once they get through the chapter on housing, for example, um, does that mean it's done or are they going to wait and get through the entire document before they say it's all done? What, what, what they have done so far is pass each section with, uh, they can make updates for the current situation. So, but the zoning, what we did for the zoning, that wouldn't be affected by that. But um, I, I don't think they've done that chapter yet and they didn't, work on a chapter, they didn't bring a chapter forward at the last uh, council meeting. And, and I'm not sure why, because the one they're working on is chapter seven, which seemed to be one of the easiest ones. So I think they still have um, the one with the map in it. I still think they have that to go through, but I'm not exactly sure. But until the comp plans totally have passed, they're not going to make any changes to it. So. Well, that's, un <laughs> that's unfortunate because, I mean, again, we, we, we wrapped our arms around this particular item on, on design standards because we thought it was urgent. Um, and those zoning changes, I consider to be equally urgent. Who right now has that huge map that we colored, Greg? Do you know? Boy, Eleanor, I don't know. I don't know if Linda's still got that. I don't know. I don't know what Linda did with all of that material that we had um, assembled as we we she went through that. To Alicia, I believe we should check and see if Dan, if you would check to see if they're still in the the planning department, because that map was really helpful. Yeah, I've actually got a small version of that map, but it's really hard to read. Yeah. So well, at any rate, I, I think, you know, like I said, I, I think there, at, as time goes on, we're just losing our opportunities on um, making those kind of modifications and compromising uh, the development the way we envisioned it. Yeah, I don't disagree with you. Well, you might plant that seed with the mayor that there are some, some items that we wrestled long and hard with uh, in assembling the comp plan that um, perhaps deserve a level of priority. My, my bet is, is that those documents are probably in the planning office and there was a temporary staff member uh, that was working with Alicia, and I don't know if she's still there or not. Scott would know. Uh, my bet is, is that big map uh, is in the planning office. Yeah, Sherry Field would be who that would be, and um, it's it's very possible that it's over there. Um, I mean, if you if you send me, um, just send it to me a detailed instruction of 
you're just looking for the map, we can find that. If there's something else, other documents you need, um, I can have those pulled for you. Well, I, I brought it up as a as potentially our next topic. If if we needed to do something to help the the commission elevate uh, the the uh, council elevate that in terms of priorities. Okay. I have a, 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 a brief, uh, the library meeting room uh, is open, although there are some restrictions on it. And so my question is, are we going to go to live meetings or are we going to continue to meet on Zoom? Uh, and I think that Pat, my memory is that Pat offered the room upstairs in the, uh, in, in the uh, uh, real estate office over there. Uh, my wife, when I mentioned that said, she, it's not, uh, handicap accessible, so is it a legal place to meet? Uh, so my question is, how much longer are we going to continue to meet on Zoom? And where, if we uh, get away from Zoom, where are we going to meet at? Well, we can't meet. Yeah. We've got a challenge on that when we tried to do it the first time. <clears throat> so, and I'm not sure what the restrictions on the library are, but I uh, contact the mayor and ask that question. Uh, I would like to vote that if we go back to meeting in person that we do Zoom as well, if if we can work that out, because I really actually prefer meeting on Zoom routinely. I, I will tell you having done meetings both ways and also having live meetings with people on Zoom that's really bad. Um, yeah. The people on Zoom literally get ignored and yeah, they don't hear very well, unfortunately. You are right. You are right. Yeah, I think it's all or nothing. So we'll ask that question. Um, I've heard rumors that council may go back in July to live meetings, but I don't think that was passed yet. I think they're hoping to, at least some of the council members are. So we can ask questions, but Richard, do you know what the restrictions are for the library? I don't know what the restrictions are. Uh, I would suggest that you could call the librarian, uh, uh, Keitha, um, and, and she would let us know. And my bet is, it's the number of people that can be allowed in the room. That's a pretty large room now, though. And it's rare that we ever have that many people, but every once in a while, we may talk about chickens again. And then we, we'll need to stir up. Yeah. <laughs> we have a convention center. Well, but the rent on the convention center is pretty high. <coughs> We're not allowed to do that. Okay. I, 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 um, I think the library, I don't want to say, it, I'm looking at it right now. It's, I mean, it's on the website. I thought like July 12th, it's going to open back up again. Oh, thanks. Cool. Okay. That's my recollection. Else? Uh, uh, taking the notes next time was supposed to be Tanya. All right. Can you do it so Tanya can finish? And then we'll just switch you to. Who, who did you want to do it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you take the notes. For me to do it? Now, could you do it next time so Tanya can finish up? Yeah. Because you were scheduled to be the next one. Yep. Okay. So Pat will do the notes next time. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Okay. So moved. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.